92nd Street Y Online Media is made possible by the generous support of listeners like you. This program features poet Maya Angelou reading from her work. It was recorded on December 9, 1971, before a live audience at New York's 92nd Street Y. I'm told that poetry is obliged to be mystical, magical, musical, and lyrical. And I believe that the great poetry in the United States is the poetry that came out of and still comes out of the black experience. I believe that a people live in direct relationship to the heroes they have whether they are tangible heroes, heroes of blood and bone and muscle and so forth, or whether they are heroes like the heroes of poetry and music. There's a line in a spiritual which to me is music and to me is poetry. It says, green trees are bending Whole sinner stands a trembling. Now that to me is poetry. It doesn't go about the business of saying, now you see the trees were being swayed because the wind was blowing from the northeast and then somebody was standing and their knees were knocking and he hadn't done the right thing and so he was kind of scared. It said, green trees are bending, Whole sinner stands a trembling. That's poetry. The great poetry in the United States, to me, mind you, has kept a people alive. It's sad to say that the first black Americans were brought here in 1619, one year before the Mayflower docked. Remember that. The American Indians to whose continent we were brought, strangers in chains and slaves more so, are now less than 600,000 in the whole United States. And the black Americans are upwards of 30 million, and that's a conservative estimate. I have one friend who says there are more than 30 million black people in the Baptist church. (laughs) And that doesn't account for the backsliders. Black Americans internalize poetry in the blues, in the spirituals. All you have to do is look at what's happening in the blues, listen to the blues, separate from the music. Just say the lyric to yourself. And you see where people are at every stage of their development. There was a time when, to quote John Killens, Black people scratched when they didn't itch and laughed when they weren't tickled. And that was a strategy. It worked. I'm very proud, of course, that uh, this generation says, uh, not for me, Jack, not me. Thank you very much, but no shuffling for me. However, I do wish they would remember that that was a very important part of our past. We survived because of those strategies, stratagem. Mr. Paul Lawrence Dunbar wrote a poem which is called Masks. And it says, we wear the mask that grins and lies. It shades our cheeks, it hides our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile. With torn and bleeding hearts, we smile and mouth myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but oh my God, our tears to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing. But oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world think otherwise. We wear the mask. A strategy. Mind you, a strategy. 
There's a woman who rides the bus, the 8th Avenue bus, and if you don't know black features, you might think she's smiling. She's not smiling, she's simply extending her lips. She goes. If the bus stops too short, she goes. Somebody gets on looking like 10 miles of dug up road, she goes. So I thought, lady, I'm gonna write a poem about you. I've seen her for months on the bus. So I wrote a poem called, When I Think About Myself. When I think about myself, I almost laugh myself to death. My life has been one great big joke. A dance was walked, a song was spoke. <laughs> I laugh so hard, I, I nearly choke when I think about myself. 60 years in these folks' world, the child I works for calls me girl. I say, yes, ma'am. For working's sake, I'm too proud to bend and too poor to break, so <laughs> I laugh until my stomach ache when I think about myself. My folks can make me split my side. I laugh so hard I nearly died. The tales they tell sound just like lying. They grow the fruit but eat the rind. <laughs> I laugh until I start to cry when I think about myself. A strategy. In this book of poetry, I've tried to deal with two kinds of love. I got pay and eros. It is true that the Greeks did have a name for it. However, my translation of agape, love, is one is not one's brother's keeper, but one is one's brother. And that poem came from the agape. There's a poem from the romantic love section, which deals with the women who, past 30, with high morals, decide upon their divorce, not me, I'll never, not, no married men, no, 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 mm -mm, honey, no. My morals are too high. But then they discover that they are physical, too. And this poem is called, They Went Home. They went home and told their wives that never once in all their lives had they met a girl like me. But they went home. They said, my house was licking clean. No word I spoke was ever mean. I had an air of mystery. But they went home. My praises were on all men's lips. They liked my smile, my wit, my hips. They'd spend one night or two or three. But a poem about signifying. Now, signifying is an Africanism because very few whites know about it and almost none know how to do it. <laughs> In West Africa, it's against the law to call a man a fool. In Ghana, you can go to jail for calling a man a fool and the charge is assault with the tongue. You can go to jail for pushing, for threatening to push, and for scandalizing. So obviously, since human beings are human beings, and people are oftentimes disenchanted with human beings, there have to be ways to, um, to let people know exactly what they think. So an Africanism that is around in the United States, very evident, is called signifying. And we have a saying which says, old folks say signifying is worse than stealing. This poem says, 
I hate to lose something. Then she bent her head. Even a dime, I wish I was dead. I can't explain it no more to be said, except I hate to lose something. I lost a doll once and cried for a week. She could open her eyes and do all but speak, and I believe she was took by some doll snatch and sneak. And I tell you, I really hate to lose something. A watch of mine once got up and walked away. It had 12 numbers on it for the time of day. I'll never forget it, and all I can say is I really hate to lose something. Now, if I felt that way about a watch and a toy, what you think I feel about my lover boy? I ain't threatening you, madam, but he is my evening's joy, and uh, I mean, I really hate to lose something. I dedicated this book to two men, to Amber Sam and the Zorro Man. And they are two men who mean a great deal to me. To a man. My man is black, golden amber, changing. Warm mouths of brandy fine. Cautious sunlight on a patterned rug. Coughing laughter rocked on a whorl of French tobacco. Secretive, a cat's eye. Southern, plump and tender with navy bean sullenness. Did I say tender? <laughs> the gentleness a big cat stalks through stubborn bush. Did I mention amber? The heatless fire consuming itself again anew into ever never lessness. My man is amber, changing, always into itself. New now, new. Still itself. Still. This is a poem I was trying to look at some phenomena which exist in our modern world. It has to do with the sexuality in the United States or in, Western, in the Western world that really not real sexuality, because it has nothing to do with that. It's called sexuality, homosexuality, bisexuality, non-sexuality, unisexuality. This poem is called Les Majest, or Let's Majest. I sit a throne upon the times when kings are rare, and consorts slide into the grease of scullery maids. So, Gaily wave that crown of light astride the royal chair that blinds the commoners who genuflect and cross their fingers. The years will lie beside me on the queenly bed, and coupled, we'll await the age's dust to cake my lids again. And when the rousing kiss is given, why must it always be a fairy and only just a prince? Still in that place of love and its loss, on divers deviations. When love is a shimmering curtain before a door of chance that leads to a world in question, wherein the macabrous dance of bones that rattle in silence, of blinded eyes and rolls of thick lips thin denying a thousand powdered molds, where touch to touch is feel, and life a weary whore, I would be carried off not gently to a shore where love is a scream of anguish, and no curtain drapes the door. That was just about where I was at the end of that, too. I was 
taken once to a fashion show, and it really has never been my stick. And uh, I was supposed to be a guest of honor. The young woman who met me at the door saw that I had a natural, this was many years ago, late 50s, and uh, affected, had the conceit of African dress. And she looked me up and down and it just blew her mind right out to lunch. <laughs> she looked at me like, yeah, what do you want? And uh, so I said, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong place. But the man who invited me said, oh, Miss Angelo, please come, no, no, and gave me a seat. And then the black ladies who were bougies, um, kept nudging each other like, look at that, what's that supposed to represent? <laughs> and then the woman who moderated the fashion show, as the models came out and posed and did their do, she said a phrase that caught between my lips, never to be lost. She said, and this is what me lady will wear to the country club. <laughs> I said, all righty. <laughs> okay, I can dig where you're coming from, as Verda Mae Grove has said. This was just after Ralph Bunch's son had been refused membership at the Forest Hill Country Club. And Mr. Bunch was an undersecretary at United Nations and he couldn't go to the country club. So I thought, I'll write a poem about you, dear. So I wrote a poem called The Sepia Fashion Show. Their hair pomaded, faces jaded, bones protruding hip-wise. The models strutted, backed up and butted, then stuck their mouths out lip-wise. They had nasty manners, held like banners while they looked down their nose-wise. I'd see them in hell before they'd tell me one thing they're wearing, clothes-wise. <laughs> the black bourgeois who all say, yeah, when yeah is what they're meaning, should look around both up and down before they set out preening. Indeed, they swear, that's what I'll wear when I go country clubbing. I'd remind them, please look at them knees they got at Miss Ann scrubbing. <laughs> Seeing that fantastic swing to the right, not only in the United States, but all over the world, frightened me so, still frightens me so, although I appear to be resigned. I wrote a poem called Miss Scarlet, Mr. Rhett, and Other Latter-day Saints. <laughs> Novitiate sing Ave, before the whipping post, crisscrossing their breast and tear-stained robes in the yielding dark. Animated by human sacrifice, Golgotha and blackface, priests glow purely white on the bar relief of a plantation shrine. Oh, saying, you are gone but not forgotten. Hail, Scarlet, requisatim pace. God make us smear brushes in blood gall to etch frescoes on your ceilinged tomb. Oh, sing, Hosanna, King Cotton. Shadowed couplings of infidels tempt stigmata from the nipples of your true believers. Chant, Mater Noster, hallowed little Eva. Ministers make novena with the charred bones of four very small, very black, very young children. Intone D-I-X-I-E, and guard the relics of your intact hymen, daily putting to death into eternity the stud, his seed, his seed, his seed. Oh, saying, hallelujah, pure scarlet, blessed red the martyr. There's a young man, 
14, I'd say, at the 8th Avenue exit of, uh, I mean the 42nd Street exit of the 8th Avenue train. He sells directions. If you get out of the train, come up and say, excuse me, which way is 6th Avenue? He says, that'll be about 20 cents. I've been told that that represents American ingenuity and Yankee know-how. <laughs> My response is that that's black survival. There's a boy at Times Square who I saw who shines shoes and he makes that rag hum some buddy. Hum buddy, hum buddy, hum. So I looked at that boy half drunk. I was, not he. I don't think. <laughs> I thought, there's something there. The money he makes is very important to his family, whether he gives it directly to his parents or not. He's, a, he's into business. He's steady on his case. So I thought I'd better write a poem for him. It says, I'm the best that ever done it. That's my title and I want it. I ain't lying, I'm the best. Come and put me to the test. I'll shine them till they squeak. In the middle of next week. I'll clean them till they whine. Till they call me mastermind. For a quarter and a dime, you can get a deluxe shine. Say you want to pay a quarter, then you give that to your daughter. I ain't playing dozens, mister. You can give it to your sister. Any way you want to read it. Maybe it's your mama need it. Say I'm like a greedy bigot. I'm a capitalist, can't you dig it? <laughs> On a bright day next week, just before the bomb falls, just before the world ends, just before I die, all my tears will powder, black in dust like ashes, black like Buddha's belly, black and hot and dry. Then will mercy tumble, falling down on, in Godheads, falling on the children, falling from the sky. I'm very impressed not positively, with the fashions, the fashion of now it's hip to do this, and now it's in to do that. This is certainly nature, and the nature of man as we see him and as we are him. In the black community, there's a, a danger, I feel, with the people who decide, oh, he ain't black enough or she's not really down with it. And that's frightening because if a black American is white-skinned enough to pass, that is still a black man passing or a black woman passing. So there's nothing a black person can do which is not black. That's like saying, uh, thinking of the fact that human beings came up with a phrase talking about other human beings saying, oh, he did an inhuman act. That's baloney. One may not like it. It may not have been a humane act, but it was human if a human being did it. And words and titles and appellations and descriptions pass in and out of fashion like the seasons. This poem is called The Calling of Names. He went to being called a colored man after answering to, hey, nigga. Now, that's a big jump anyway you figure. Baby, watch my smoke. From colored man to Negro with the N in caps. That was like saying Japanese instead of saying Japs. I mean, during the war. His next big step was a change for true. From Negro in caps to being a Jew, not saying Yiddish or mama. Light, yellow, brown, dark brown skin, 
These were okay colors to describe him then. He was a bouquet of roses. He changed his seasons like an almanac. And now you'll get cut if you don't call him black. And nigga, I ain't playing this time. My guilt is slavery's chains. Too long the clang of irons fall down the years. This brother's sold, this sister's gone. This bitter wax in my ears. My guilt made music with the tears. My crime is heroes dead and gone. Dead Vesey, Turner, Gabriel. Dead Malcolm, Marcus, Martin King. They fought so hard, they loved so well. My crime is I'm alive to tell. My sin is hanging from a tree. I do not scream, it makes me proud. I take to dying like a man. I do it to impress the crowd. My sin lies in not screaming loud. I think there's something wrong with the way we look at the drug situation today. Very wrong. I believe if any human being saw another human being being swallowed by a boa constrictor, we'd pick up this book and strike the boa constrictor. That's the most obscene thing I've ever seen. And I have seen the boa constrictor, boa constrictors swallowing uh, goats, small bush meat. And there's nothing more repelling than to see that gradual doing away with something already dead, mind you, crushed to death. And yet, you want to strike the boa constrictor and pull this dead goat out of its jaws. And we see human beings being swallowed by something much more pervasive, much more fatal, much more demeaning. And we say, that's the whole man. The dope plus the man equals the whole man. That's like saying, this stage plus Maya equals the stage. And the argument that these people who become dope addicts are more voluntary, I mean, chose to indulge themselves while the person who swallowed by the boa constrictor did not. It doesn't follow. I drink, I have a drink, many of you probably do. The first time the drug addict has his, a drug addict to be, has his shot, it makes him sick. The second makes him feel great, and the third one, he's hooked. And it behooves us, the society, it seems to me, it behooves us, the society, to reach and grab that man by his feet and pull him out of the maw of that creature. I wrote a poem called Letter to an Aspiring Junkie. Let me hip you to the streets, Jim. Ain't nothing happening. Maybe some tomorrow's gone up in smoke. Raggedy preachers telling a joke to lonely, sunless old ladies' maids. Ain't nothing happening. Nothing shaking, Jim. Oh, there's a slew of young cats riding that cold white horse. A gray old monkey on their back, of course, does rodeo tricks. No haps, baby. No haps. There's an old-time pimp with a space-age conk setting up some fool for a game of tonk or poker or get him dead and alive. The streets, you climb in the streets like you climb in the ass end of a lion. Then it's fine. Then it's a boogaloo and a shingling. Then it's African dreams on a buck and a wing and a prayer. That's the streets, baby. Ain't nothing happening. Harlem hopscotch. Hopscotch, I suppose, is 
jump the same all over the world. The time is What I try for in writing poetry, and I'm trying to be a poet, I think trying to be a poet is like trying to be a Christian or trying to grow up or trying to be a good Jew or trying to be a good Muslim. At 80, I will still be trying to do it. What I try for in my poetry is to understand the content and then to find the rhythm, since everything has a rhythm to me and try to find that rhythm and make the content fit, fit that rhythmic structure, whether it's free form or not. Now, I watched black kids in Harlem jumping hopscotch, and while the bass rhythm is understandably, since all black people can sing and dance, except many friends of mine who can. Um, the, the rhythm is more complex. And what the black kids who are jumping hopscotch are thinking is more complex than, say, what the kids on Park Avenue who are jumping hopscotch think, or the people that, in Shaker Heights or in Georgetown. So I wrote Harlem Hopscotch. It says, one foot down in hop is hot, Good things for the ones that's got. Another jump, not to the left. Everybody for himself in the air. Now both feet down. Since you're black, don't stick around. Food is gone. Rent is due. Cuss and cry, and then jump too. Everybody's out of work. Hold for three and not twist and jerk. Cross the line that counts you out, but that's what hopping's all about. Both feet down. The game is done. They think you lost, and I think you won. And on working with white liberals, un un interestingly enough, this poem has been misunderstood by most of my white liberal friends. And I've decided that I really want to be heard. There's a, a chapter in the first Corinthians, I think it's the 12th chapter, in which Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says, you ask me whether it is better to prophesy or to speak in tongues. I myself can't answer you. But I'll say this, if you speak in tongues, only you and God understand it. If you prophesy, you take the chance of benefiting the whole community. Now, I would like to be heard. I would like to be understood. Uh, it defeats me when I'm not. I know since my friend and sister told me a couple of weeks, don't everybody like apples? So, <laughs> so I stand that chance. But it did, <laughs> did sadden me that many of my friends misunderstood on working with white liberals. It was written about 12 years ago. I don't ask the Foreign Legion or anyone to win my freedom or to fight my battle better than I can. There is one thing I cry for and believe enough to die for, that is every man's responsibility to man. I'm afraid they'd have to prove first that they'd watch the black man move first, then follow him with faith to kingdom come. See, this rocky road's not paved for us, so I believe in liberals aid for us when I see a white man load a black man's gun. I don't even choose to explain it now either, because you all didn't understand it. <laughs> I tried to write a poem on the Vietnam War directly, and I kept trying. I write, it takes me sometimes six months to finish a piece of poetry. And we keep waltzing around and doing our do. And I never was able to finish it directly on the Vietnam War. But this is a poem which di 
deals with and is directed to wars, I suppose. We saw beyond our seeming these days of bloodied screaming, of children dying, bloated, out where the lilies floated, of men all noosed and dangling within the temple strangling, our guilt gray fungus growing, we knew and lied our knowing. Deaf and all unwilling, we aided in the killing. And now our souls lie broken, dry tablets without token. And I think the last poem is a poem called No, 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 No. No, the two-legged beast talk like men, play stink finger in their crusty asses, while crackling babies in napalm coats stretch mouths to receive burning tears on splitting tongues. Just give me a cool drink of water before I die. No, the gap-legged whore of the eastern shore enticing Europe to come in her, but turns her back to me, to me who stoked the coal which drove the ships that brought her over the sinuous cemetery of my many brothers. No, the cocktailed afternoons of, what can I do in my white ladied pink world? I've let your men cram my mouth with their black throbbing hate, and I swallowed after. I've let your mammy steal from my kitchens. I was always half amused. I've chuckled the chins of your topsy-haired pickaninnies. Now what can I do? I'll never be black like you, hallelujah. No. The red shoed priest riding palanquin in barefoot children country. Plastered saints gaze down beneficently on kneeling mothers picking undigested beans from yesterday's shit. I have waited, toes curled, hat rolled, heart, genitals in hand on the back porches of forever, in the kitchens and fields of rejection, on the cold marble steps of America's great white outhouse in the drop seats of buses and in the open flies of wars. No more the dream that you will cease haunting me down in fetid swamps of fear and will turn to embrace your own humanity, which I am. No more the hope that razored insults which mercury slide off your tongue will be forgotten and you will learn the words of love. Mother, father, brother, sister, lover, friend. My hopes dying slowly, rose petals falling beneath an autumn red moon will not adorn your unmarked graves. And my dreams lying quietly, a black pool beneath the trees will not carry your name to a forgetful shore. And what a pity, what a pity. When pity has folded in upon itself an old man's mouth whose teeth are gone, and I have no pity. Thanks for listening. 92nd Street Y, Unterberg Poetry Center webcasts, and access to our archive are made possible by the generous support of listeners like you. 
For more information on 92nd Street Y and all our programs, please visit us on the web at 92y.org. This program is copyright 1971 by 92nd Street Y. Thank you.